Welcome to Maine at 200. You're about to watch a decade-by-decade -decade account of some of the more remarkable things that have happened in the state of Maine during the last two centuries, just in time for the state to celebrate its 200th birthday. I'm Phil Blampede, producer of Maine at 200. Several knowledgeable people and myself are going to show you dozens of remarkable events that have happened in Maine during the last 200 years. It's a timeline of the most important events that have occurred, some of which are amazing just in and of themselves, and others which are still having an impact on the state today. I'm confident that you're going to find quite a lot of this information very surprising. Did you know that Maine almost didn't become a state because the majority of its congressional delegation voted against it? Did you know that in the early years of the state when the border between the United States and Canada was still badly defined and the British and the Americans were having conflicts over it, that one of the only military victories the Americans won in northern Maine came about because a bear joined them in attacking the enemy? Did you know that when a military plane crashed one July morning in 1944, it ranked as the worst air disaster in Maine history until a second, worse crash happened only a few hours later? Did you know the first woman to serve in both houses of the U.S. Congress came from Maine, and that there was once an effort to host the Winter Olympics in Maine with Augusta as its headquarters? These are only a few examples of the remarkable things that have happened in Maine in the last 200 years. Maine at 200 is in four parts of slightly more than 20 minutes each. It starts with the founding of the state on March 15, 1820, and continues up until the present day. Whether you watch it in parts or watch it all at once, there are a few ways better to celebrate the bicentennial of Maine than to take some time to hear about the details of its colorful history. I hope you enjoy it. Part 1. Maine from 1820 to the Civil War. Yesterday, Maine became a state. The day was noticed, as far as we have heard from the various towns, by every demonstration of joy and heartfelt congratulation as becoming the occasion. That was a report in the Eastern Argus, a newspaper in Portland, Maine. It was March 15, 1820, and Maine was finally a state, something it achieved only after decades of effort. Maine was originally part of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and at first, most Mainers liked it that way. Residents voted no fewer than six times between 1792 and 1819 on whether to leave Massachusetts. Statehood failed on the first five votes. It was only in the final vote, in July of 1819, that Mainers cast their ballots with a total of 17,091 in favor of statehood to 7,132 against. Behind the new majority in favor of statehood was a growing population, restless for more local control, and a lingering resentment that the Commonwealth of Massachusetts had let British armies seize what was almost the full northern third of the state during the War of 1812. The British retreated back to Canada only after the peace treaty required them to. Things happened quickly after the 1819 vote, with a convention held at Portland's first parish church meeting hall in October to write a constitution for the state, and another popular vote in December with 92% of the voters approving that new constitution. The march to statehood slowed only when it came time for the U.S. Congress to accept Maine as a new state. Southern members of Congress were unwilling to let northern states, where slavery was outlawed, to get a majority of the members of Congress. A complex deal, now known as the Missouri Compromise, was orchestrated by Speaker of the House Henry Clay to trade the admission of Missouri as a slave state in order to balance the votes of Maine coming in as a free state. Because the deal expanded slave territory into Missouri, many in Maine were opposed to it even though their statehood depended on it. When the final vote was cast, five out of the seven congressmen from Maine, still a Massachusetts district, actually voted against the Missouri Compromise, which squeaked by with a majority of only three votes. If the two congressmen from Maine who voted in favor of the Missouri Compromise had voted against it instead, Maine would have failed to gain statehood by one vote. In 1821, the town of Canton was founded. In 1823, the town of Skowhegan was incorporated using the name Milburn. The name was changed to Skowhegan in 1836. 
In 1826, a cotton mill was founded on Factory Island in the Saco River in Saco. The mill was eventually called York Manufacturing and it remained open until 1958. In 1827, Waldo County was founded and Augusta was named the state capital. However, the legislature met in Portland until the completion in 1832 of the new Maine State House, designed by the famous architect Charles Bullfinch. By 1830, the population of Maine was 399,455, showing an increase of more than a third during the first 10 years since the founding of the state. In 1831, North Berwick was incorporated as a town. In 1832, the state capital was finally moved to Augusta, five years after the legislature first voted to move it from Portland. In 1833, Melville Fuller, who became the Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court in 1888, was born in Augusta. In 1835, a lumber boom around Bangor made it the biggest lumber port in the world. Logs were floated down the Penobscot River from the thick woods north of the city, processed at sawmills in the city, then shipped down the river to the Atlantic and then to ports around the world. In 1836, the first railroad in Maine opened, carrying lumber 11 miles from Old Town to Bangor. That year, Milton Bradley, founder of the toy company, was born in Vienna. In 1838, Franklin and Piscataquis counties were founded, and the conflict that had been simmering in northern Maine between Canadian and American loggers flamed into the short-lived Aroostook War. Here's the story. In the early 19th century, the border between the United States and Canada wasn't very clearly drawn. The uh, treaties that ended the American Revolution and the War of 1812 had uh, tried to define the border, but they hadn't done a very good job. And by the 1820s, there was a lot of conflict in northern Maine where it borders New Brunswick, in particular because there was a lot of valuable timber in that area and uh, American loggers wanted to take trees in areas that Canadians thought were theirs, and Canadian loggers wanted to take trees in areas that the Americans thought were theirs. Um, as a result, there, was, there, were, there were a lot of uh, confrontations, and um, many new American settlers moved into the area who took advantage of these confrontations to try to create uh, a movement to separate that territory from the St. Johns River in New Brunswick over to what is now Aroostook County and make it part of the state of Maine, make it part of uh, the United States. At one point, the American settlers in the region even tried to declare their own republic, the Republic of Madawaska, for which they even designed a flag. And uh, the state of Maine finally sent some agents to the area to investigate what was going on, to see what the population was up there and what their sentiments were. And the Canadian authorities attempted to arrest these agents. Uh, this drew the attention of the federal government, the U.S. government, and uh, it started to become a more serious matter. The uh, um, Americans contacted the government of Great Britain and said that this was a matter that needed to be arbitrated. So Great Britain and the United States picked King William of the Netherlands as an, uh, an independent arbiter. And he gave the United States and Great Britain a proposed border between uh, New Brunswick and Maine. The British accepted William's border, but the United States did not. And both uh, the U.S. Congress and the state of Maine rejected the border, so, so that, that got nowhere. After King William's border proposal was rejected, uh, things continued to heat up between the Americans and the Canadians at the border. And uh, things had gotten so out of hand that by uh, 1838, both the Maine legislature and the U.S. Congress appropriated funds to send troops to the border to uh, defend, supposedly, the Americans and their claims in Madawaska against the Canadians. Federal troops were never mobilized, but the state of Maine did manage to send several thousand volunteers to the border where they set up rough encampments all along the American side. Despite all this, the Aroostook War remained a bloodless war until 1838. There's no record of uh, any fatalities or any shots being fired. But that all almost changed in the last few days of 1838. Uh, according to one record, on December 29th, 1838, some New Brunswick lumberjacks were spotted felling trees on what was considered to be American land. The owners of the land contacted some American lumberjacks in the area and others who have been active as militia in the past, and a small American force was, was raised and proceeded to start patrolling the area where the lumberjacks, the Canadians, had been seen. 
Two days later, New Year's Eve, the New Brunswick woodcutters came back and they were ordered to leave by the Americans who were now patrolling the area. The, the Canadians refused to leave. And so both sides pulled their firearms out and it looked like a battle was about to begin. But just as this was about to start, a bear came out of the woods and started harassing the Canadians. The uh, Canadians had to start defending themselves against the bear. Uh, two of the Canadians were actually injured by the bear. They finally killed the bear, facing both having the Americans having their firearms out and having been attacked by a bear, the Canadians withdrew. So this was, thanks to the bear, considered an American victory of sorts. It was clear to, to uh, all involved that things were, were really on the brink of, of getting out of hand and that a real shooting war might begin. So the U.S. government stepped in and uh, sent uh, U.S. General Winfield Scott, who has later become famous for his role in the Mexican-American War, and uh, he, he came to the area and uh, managed to negotiate a truce. And so the Aroostook War came to a uh, relatively peaceful end uh, in March of 1839 the United States and Great Britain finally did negotiate a better written treaty which defined the American-Canadian border more precisely and uh, conflicts settled down after that time. Even though the Aroostook War might seem to have been a very minor encounter, there were a couple of milestones. One was that it was the last time a single state ever attempted to confront a foreign government militarily. Maine was on the verge of sending its own troops to do battle with Great Britain. The federal government hadn't gotten involved yet. The other milestone is that the Aroostook War was the last time that the United States and Great Britain ever had a military confrontation. In 1839, following a truce in the Aroostook War, Aroostook County was founded. In 1840, the population of Maine was 501,793. The town of Old Town was separated from Orono and incorporated as an independent town. In 1842, the Aroostook War was finally settled as U.S. Secretary of State Daniel Webster and British Lord Ashburton signed the Webster-Ashburton Treaty, an agreement that resolved border questions between the United States and Canada from Maine to the Great Lakes. In the process, some of the most adamant supporters of making the Madawaska area part of the United States actually wound up having their land located in Canada. Also in 1842, an anti-abolitionist riot broke out at the First Parish Church in Portland. The church had been the center of anti-slavery activities, including hosting a speech at one point by abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison, when they invited the more vehement anti-slavery activist, Stephen Simmons Foster, to speak, a mob of anti-abolitionists and pro-slavery men attacked the speakers. Foster received numerous blows to the head and had his coat torn in half before several women of the parish helped him escape through a back window. A plaque on the building still commemorates the event today. In 1845, Poland spring water came onto the market for the first time. Mark Dubois, natural resource manager for Poland Spring Today, tells the story. So the Ricker and uh, Poland Springs story really started in the late 1700s in 1794 when uh, Jabez Ricker uh, did a land swap with the Shakers of Sabbath Day Lake uh, for swapping land in Alfred with the land here in Poland Spring. Uh, they actually, the Rickers started out doing uh, um, an inn along Route 26 as a stagecoach stop. By 1844, um, Jabez Ricker's son, Hiram Ricker, actually suffered from dyspepsia. He had some stomach issues, and uh, it was a, a local legend that he actually drank from the spring uh, for a number of days in a row, um, improved his health, and uh, they started to look at the spring on their property um, as potentially having some medicinal properties. Um, so by 1845, they were uh, bottling the water in uh, clay demijohns, which I'll show you over there. And the family started to make first commercial sales of water uh, out of the port of Portland and um, selling water in Portland. In 1847, Bath incorporated as a city. In 1848, the world was at last able to buy chewing gum, thanks to John B. Curtis of Bangor, who developed a gum made out of spruce sap and sold it as pure spruce gum. It was the first commercially available chewing gum. Demand was so great, he eventually opened a factory in Portland. In 1849, the effects of the gold rush in California began to be felt in Maine. There was a great increase in the demand for Maine lumber, particularly that shipped out of the big lumber port in Bangor. 
Despite the long passage around the tip of South America to California, the demand for Maine wood in the California gold fields was strong until sawmills could be established locally. Eventually, Maine residents, including many from Bangor, made the passage themselves, and some of these were the ones who helped get the California sawmills going. The names of some towns in California reflect this, including Bangor, California. By 1850, the population of Maine was 583,169. Also in 1850, the Bates Manufacturing Company founded its textile mill in Lewiston to use the water power from the Androscoggin River. The Bates Manufacturing Company thrived during the Civil War. Founder Benjamin Bates had purchased massive stores of cotton just before trade was cut off with the South, and then Bates supplied uniforms to the Union Army. And in 1850, Pepperell Company established mills on the Saco River in Biddeford. In 1851, spurred by prohibitionists like Portland's Neil Dow, Maine became the first state in the nation to try to ban the manufacture and sale of alcohol. The law set off a riot in Portland a few years later, and by the end of the decade, it had been repealed. In 1852, Harriet Beecher Stowe published the influential book Uncle Tom's Cabin. Much of the book was composed in Brunswick, where her husband Calvin Ellis Stowe taught at his alma mater, Bowdoin College. In 1853, the completion of the section of the Grand Trunk Railway from Quebec to Maine made Portland the primary ice-free seaport for Canadian exports in the winter, spurring an era of prosperity in Portland that lasted for decades. Much of the rail line is still intact in western Maine. And in 1853, Belfast was incorporated as a city. In 1854, Androscoggin and Sagadahawk counties were formed. In Westbrook, the S.D. Warren Paper Company was launched, a company still active today as Sappy Limited. The Warren Mill was the first to mix wood fibers and rag fibers in the papermaking process and became the largest in the world. Also in 1854, there was an upsurge of violence against Roman Catholics in several parts of Maine, with the Roman Catholic Church in Bath burned to the ground by a mob. Here's the story. The decade of the 1850s in Maine saw an unprecedented explosion of violence against Roman Catholics and the Roman Catholic Church. This was the result of uh, factors that are, were evident across the nation at that time. There had been a tremendous wave of immigration of Catholic immigrants from Germany, especially from Ireland after the potato famine in Ireland. And these new immigrants were competing with the old Yankee Protestant workers for jobs, causing some resentments. And uh, then, as now, uh, politicians arose to take advantage of these re resentments. In, in uh, the United States, it was in the form of a party called the American Party, which uh, was also called the Know Nothings because uh, they started out as a secret organization. And when they were, as members of this organization, they were any asked anything about what their activities were, they were supposed to say, I know nothing. And as a result, they were derisively called the Know Nothings by people who opposed them. The Know Nothings were, were quite successful. They actually managed to win a majority of the, uh, the seats in the Massachusetts legislature in the mid 1850s. And they helped foment uh, resentment against Catholics and all immigrants. In Bath in 1854, a Catholic church was burned to the ground. A Jesuit priest, uh, Johannes Bapst, was tarred and feathered in Ellsworth. A church was set on fire in Lewiston. And um, things were so tense that uh, when the uh, vicar of Baltimore was offered the position of the Bishop of Portland, he refused the job because he thought it was too dangerous. Uh, it was finally two years later that the church was able to find a man from Brooklyn, David Bacon, who came to Portland and agreed to accept the job of bishop. But he had to come into town at night wearing layman's clothes because they were afraid it would trigger a riot if he did anything else. Things finally calmed down. The uh, American Party uh, faded away because, oddly enough, half of its members were against slavery and they eventually were absorbed by the Republican Party. And then a lot of the violent energies that existed in the society at the time were, were subsumed by the Civil War as all the young men went off to war and a lot of the energy that was on the street now was on the battlefield. In 1855, Bates College was founded, initially called the Maine State Seminary. It was the first co-educational university in New England and the first to admit African Americans. The name was changed in 1865 to acknowledge the significant financial support the college had received from mill owner Benjamin Bates. 
In 1857, the Cabot Manufacturing Company was established in Brunswick to make cotton textiles. It eventually grew so large that the town actually moved Main Street to accommodate it. In 1859, Frank O. Farrington of Brewer patented a machine for edging and turning bricks, and Brewer became a regional center for brickmaking with over a dozen brickyards eventually turning out 12 million bricks annually. It is said that most of the famous Back Bay and South End neighborhoods of Boston with their stately row houses and townhouses are built of Brewer brick. Part 2, Maine from the Civil War to the First World War. In 1860, the population of Maine was 628,279. In 1861, riots broke out in Lewiston. They were called the Cotton Riots, since many of the rioters were workers from the Bates Mill who were provoked by a rumor that Benjamin Bates, the mill owner, had accumulated a vast fortune. Bates regarded the riots as a public embarrassment and subsequently made an effort to hire more people in his mills, as well as create a charitable division within his company that wound up giving thousands of dollars to needy local people and also helped to create Bates College. Also in 1861, the Civil War broke out and Maine was heavily involved. Maine contributed more men to the Union forces on a per capita basis than any other state. John McCann, a Civil War specialist and a member of the Lovell, Maine Historical Society, explains some of the reasons why. Pretty common across all of Maine, there was a sense of uh, this was something that needed to be done, a sense of duty, uh, a sense of obligation, uh, love of union. Uh, Maine had been formed in 1820 as a result of the Missouri Compromise and came into the uh, country as sort of a counterbalance to a slave state. So interestingly, sort of a, uh, a, a connection there right from the start to the south and to the dispute between the two sides of the of the country, north and south. And I think overall, probably a sense of duty and also a bit of adventure. Um, seems sort of exciting to go off to war and do something exciting and thrilling. The Revolutionary War veterans had been passing away and people still remembered them though and they had listened to stories and uh, they were sadly disabused of the no uh, notion of war as a romance, um, but that was something that drew people initially as well. In 1862, the U.S. Army built Camp Keys in Augusta. In World War I, it served as a mobilization center for troops, and it's still in use by the National Guard today. In 1863, the only recorded Civil War battle in Maine happened on June 26th. A Confederate naval vessel operating off the New England coast was being hotly pursued by Union ships. So the crew seized a fishing schooner and burned their own vessel to throw the Union ships off their trail. Using the hijacked schooner, the Confederates sailed into Portland Harbor the next day. They seized an unguarded U.S. revenue cutter, the Caleb Cushing, one of the armed ships operated by the Federal Customs Service. However, the Confederates were seen taking the Cushing and were soon being pursued by two civilian boats, one with several dozen soldiers from Fort Preble on board and the other with dozens of armed civilians under the leadership of Jacob McClellan, the mayor of Portland. The mayor ship caught up to the Cushing. The Confederates then burned the Cushing, which exploded due to the munitions in its hold, and surrendered to the mayor and his armed civilians. Citizens of Portland were so outraged over the raid that the captured Confederates were hustled out of state for their own safety and imprisoned in Massachusetts. In 1864, Lewiston incorporated as a city. The Farmington Normal School, now the University of Maine at Farmington, began operating as the first public college in Maine on August 24th. In 1865, the University of Maine was founded as a land grant and sea college. In 1866, the city of Portland, Maine suffered a catastrophic fire. The Great Fire of Portland, Maine, which occurred on July 4th, 1866, ignited during the Independence Day celebrations and destroyed most of the commercial buildings of the city, half the churches, and hundreds of homes. More than 10,000 people were left homeless and two people died. The fire started in a boathouse on Commercial Street, perhaps caused by a firecracker or a cigar ash. The fire spread to a lumberyard and then to a sugar house, then across the city, eventually burning out on Munjoy Hill in the city's east end. In 1867, British-born Thomas Goodall established the Goodall Mills in Sanford. 
His factory, located on the Mausum River, first manufactured carriage robes and blankets. Later it would expand to many other products, including mohair for upholstering railroad seats, carpets, draperies, auto fabrics, military uniform fabrics, and fabric for summer suits. Also in 1867, Saco incorporated as a city. In 1869, Ellsworth incorporated as a city. In 1870, the population of Maine was 626,915, a decline of two-tenths of a percent from 1860, and it was the first time population had decreased. John McCann of the Lovell Historical Society explains one of the reasons. One of the things that happened during the Civil War is people who had not had a lot of mobility um, up to the 1860s to, to be on a train or to, to go anywhere of any distance was was quite an unusual thing. But these men had traveled great distances and they'd been in Pennsylvania or Maryland or Ohio or Virginia and they realized that Maine perhaps was a harsher place to be a farmer, a harsher place to raise a family than need be. So many folks returned here and then left shortly thereafter with their families. Um, and you can see the evidence of that here to this day. Anytime you see a stone wall in a forest, you know that wasn't a forest when they put the stone wall in, that that's regrowth and land that had been left because people had departed and moved on. Also in 1870, the state of Maine made an unprecedented decision to recruit immigrants to settle some of the undeveloped northern lands by sending a representative to Sweden offering free land to would-be settlers. Glenn Parkinson is a board member of the Ski Museum of Maine the International Skiing History Association and the U.S. National Ski Hall of Fame, as well as the author of the main ski history book, First Tracks. He tells the story. In the mid-1800s, the northern part of Maine was covered in woods and it was essentially wilderness. There was very little civilization once you got north of Bangor. The state of Maine wanted to see that northern part settled. So a gentleman by the name of Widrig Thomas had been ambassador to Sweden. He suggested that the Swedes would be good settlers up there. They were used to long winters and harsh conditions. So May of that year, 1870, Widrig Thomas sailed to Sweden and re he recruited Swedes. July 23rd, 1870, Widrig Thomas arrived back in what is now the town of New Sweden with 22 men, 11 women, and 18 children. They were given land and a home, and that winter, 1870-71, 150 years ago, that was the first time that anyone skied in the state of Maine. Prior to that, people had used snowshoes to travel through the, the deep snows of Maine winters. Those Swedes did what they knew. They knew skiing, so they brought skis over with them. The Swedes were very enterprising people. They were each given a plot of land, and... When they arrived in July, they immediately went to work clearing the land and planting crops. And they got through the first winter and uh, went on from there to sp spread out. town of Stockholm and some of the other towns up there were all offshoots from this original community of Swedes in the town of New Sweden. In 1873, Oakland was incorporated as the town of West Waterville. The name was changed to Oakland in 1883. Also in 1873, earmuffs for the purpose of thermal protection were invented by Chester Greenwood of Farmington, Maine. He reportedly came up with the idea while ice skating and he asked his grandmother to sew tufts of fur between loops of wire. His true innovation and the reason he got a patent was a V-shaped swivel hinge that kept the earmuffs tight to the ear. He later founded a factory in his hometown of Farmington to produce earmuffs and other products. In its best year, 1936, the earmuff factory produced over 400,000 pairs. In 1977, the state of Maine declared December 21st to be Chester Greenwood Day. Farmington, Maine continues to celebrate Chester Greenwood Day with a parade on the first Saturday in December. In 1874, a Lovell, Maine native capped a remarkable career by becoming the governor of Florida. Marcellus Lovejoy Stearns left Colby College to join the Union Army as a private in 1861, serving throughout the Civil War and eventually losing an arm in battle. Thanks to connections made in the Army, Stearns was hired to join the federal government's reconstruction effort in Florida as part of the Freedmen's Bureau. He became involved in Republican Party politics in the state, 
and first won election to the state legislature and then as lieutenant governor in 1872. When the governor died in 1874, Stearns rose to the governorship. He is known as the last Reconstruction-era governor of Florida. Also in 1874, Maine Medical Center in Portland opened for the first time as Maine General Hospital. Architect Francis Fassett designed the new hospital to include four pavilions around a central administration building. In 1875, the Maine legislature for the first time made education compulsory for all children between the ages of 9 and 15, requiring that they attend school at least three months a year. In April 1878, the first commercial telephone system opened in Maine when phones were installed at the offices of Randall and McAllister, a coal company, at 84 Commercial Street in Portland. In 1880, the population had reached 648,936. Telephone service was introduced in Augusta, the state capital, for the first time. The telephone book followed soon after in 1881. The National Bell Telephone Company published a directory with seven pages listing 425 subscribers. In 1882, the Portland Society of Art, later the Portland Museum, was founded. In 1883, the town of Old Orchard Beach was incorporated. In 1884, Augusta resident, Maine U.S. Senator, and former Secretary of State James Blaine ran for president as a Republican but lost narrowly to Grover Cleveland, the Democrat. Earlier, when he was a member of the state legislature, Blaine had purchased and lived in a house in Augusta. His family later donated it to the state, and it's now the governor's official residence, named the Blaine House. Blaine served twice as Secretary of State and unsuccessfully sought the Republican nomination for president in 1876 and 1880, before finally being nominated in 1884. Blaine was one of the 19th century's leading Republicans and a champion of the moderate reformist faction of the party. Also in 1884, Bath Iron Works was founded. In 1886, the town of Farmington suffered a devastating fire on October 22nd when 33 houses, 19 stores, 3 churches, the county jail, and the post office were destroyed. In 1887, Charles Foster established the first wooden toothpick factory in the United States in Strong, Maine. He used white birch from the surrounding woods for his picks. His enterprise made Strong the self-described toothpick capital of the world, with production levels eventually peaking in the 20th century with an estimated 75 billion toothpicks a year. Also in 1887, capital punishment was abolished in Maine. The last person executed in Maine was a 40-year-old escaped convict, Daniel Wilkinson, who was hanged on November 21, 1885 at the state prison in Thomaston for the murder of a police constable. The death penalty was abolished a few years later in part because of the slow and agonizing way witnesses saw him die. In 1888, electricity came to the town of Ellsworth for the first time. In 1889, the city of Lewiston saw its first hospital established by the Sisters of Charity of Montreal who opened the Asylum of Our Lady of Lourdes. In that year, the city of Brewer was incorporated and the first electric trolley line in Maine opened in Bangor. In 1890, the population of Maine had grown to 661,086. In 1891, Old Town incorporated as a city. In 1892, poet and author Edna St. Vincent Millay was born in Rockland. In 1894, famous movie director John Ford was born in Cape Elizabeth. Also in 1894, the first steel-hulled sailing vessel built in the United States was built by the Sewell Shipyard in Bath. Named Dirigo, it was meant as a transitional vessel between sailing ships and steamers, and the Sewells built a few more before steel-hulled steamers made sailing ships obsolete as freighters. Modern times overtook the Dirigo in a more dramatic way as well, when on May 31, 1917, the ship was sunk by a German submarine just off the coast of England. In 1897, the brothers Francis and Freeland Stanley of Kingfield produced their first Stanley steamer automobile, run by the power of hot water and sold from 1902 to 1924. In 1898, the sinking of a battleship named after the state of Maine in Havana Harbor in Cuba sparked the Spanish-American War in which hundreds of Maine soldiers and sailors were to serve. Prisoners of war of the Spanish-American War were brought to Maine and encamped on the grounds of the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard in Kittery. Also in 1898, the old Orchard Beach Pier was built. 
The pier had a ballroom at its end and hosted such acts as Guy Lombardo, Louis Armstrong, Benny Goodman, Xavier Cougart, and Frank Sinatra. And in that year, the first canoe built by the Old Town Canoe Company was constructed behind the Gray Hardware Store in Old Town, Maine. In 1900, the population of Maine had reached 694,466. In 1901, the Oxford Paper Company was established in Rumford by Hugh Chisholm. It used the power of the Rumford Falls on the Androscoggin River to manufacture paper. The company was the sole manufacturer of the U.S. Post Office postcards as well as the country's largest book paper manufacturer. Later, it produced glossy paper for magazines. In 1905, construction of the cathedral in Lewiston, known as the Church of Saints Peter and Paul, began and wasn't finished until 1938. It's the largest Roman Catholic church in Maine and Lewiston's most prominent landmark. In 1908, a fire burned Portland City Hall on January 24th, leaving only the walls standing. It was considered a total loss and was the second time the building had burned, the first being during the Great Fire of 1866. On July 8, 1908, Nelson Rockefeller, later to become Governor of New York State and Vice President of the United States, was born on his family's estate in Bar Harbor. In 1909, the largest wooden ship ever built was launched in Bath. The ship was called Wyoming, and it was a wooden six-masted schooner built and completed by the firm of Percy and Small. With a length of 450 feet, Wyoming was the largest known wooden ship ever built. But the size caused problems. Due to the extreme length and wood construction, Wyoming tended to flex in heavy seas, which would cause the long planks in its hull to twist and buckle. This would allow seawater to get into the hull and required the Wyoming to use pumps to stay afloat. The design flaws finally caught up to the Wyoming when in March 1924, the ship foundered in heavy seas and sank with the loss of all hands. In 1910, the population of Maine had risen to 742,371. In 1911, Bangor suffered a catastrophic fire, now known as the Great Fire of 1911. The city lost its high school, its post office, its customs house, the public library, telephone and telegraph companies, banks, two fire stations, nearly a hundred businesses, six churches, a synagogue, and 285 private residences. The area was rebuilt, however, and in the process became a showplace for a diverse range of architectural styles, so much so that it was listed on the National Register of Historic Places as the Great Fire of 1911 Historic District. Also in 1911, a head-on collision of two trains north of Bangor in Grindstone killed 15 people, including five members of the Presque Isle Brass Band. It was the worst train accident in Maine's history. In 1912, the first hospital in Presque Isle was established. Also in that year, Leon L. Bean opened a store in the basement of his brother's apparel shop at Freeport Corner, selling the Bean Boot, or Maine Hunting Shoe. Jim Witherall, author of the biography L.L. Bean, The Man and His Company, tells how the famous Bean Boot came into existence. The story of the L.L. Bean Boot begins around 1911 when L.L. Bean one day came back from a hunting trip with wet, cold, sore feet from the uh, leather work boots he wore that day. He had already tried other uh, boots, such as long uh, rubber boots, but they tended to be uh, clumsy and made his feet sweat. So he decided there must be a better way, um, and that led him to the development of the what was originally called the main hunting shoe. It's now called the, the bean boot by most people, even though there's, there's actually a distinction between the two. And they consist of a leather upper and a uh, injection molded uh, rubber bottom that's uh, very durable. Uh, the original ones weren't so durable. They consisted of uh, rubbers that you would put over your dress shoes to keep them dry, which was sewn to um, lakes uh, elk skin uh, uppers by a local cobbler named Dennis Bibber. Uh, the first uh, hundred that L.L. Bean sold to uh, out-of-staters who'd purchased uh, out-of-state hunting and fishing licenses, uh, 90 of those 100 were returned because they were defective with the rubber bottom tearing away from the, uh, 
the leather upper. Uh, true to his word, L.L. Bean refunded their money, uh, borrowed $400 and went to Boston to have uh, better rubber bottoms made by the U.S. rubber company, I believe. The uh, L.L. Bean guarantee, I guess you could say, took effect that, that very, that same time when he refunded the, all of the money to the, the dissatisfied customers. In 1916, Acadia National Park on Mount Desert Island was founded on July 8th as Sir de Mont National Monument. The park was based on land donated by people including George Dorr, a Massachusetts native who moved to Bar Harbor. Because of Dorr's work urging the government to create the park, he's called the father of Acadia National Park. Dorr served as its first superintendent. In February 1919, the name was changed to Lafayette National Park, making it the first national park east of the Mississippi. It was not until January 1929 that it was officially named Acadia National Park. The word Acadia likely stems from Arcadia, a beautiful pastoral region of Greece. Part 3. Maine in the Era of the Two World Wars. In 1917, on April 1st, President Woodrow Wilson declared war on Germany. Maine's National Guard was called up immediately and preparations were made for fortifying the coast. Most of the soldiers from Maine wound up in the 26th Infantry Division based in Massachusetts and known as the Yankee Division because soldiers from all over New England were included in it. More than 32,000 Mainers served in the armed forces during the conflict with 1,026 deaths. Three World War I veterans, William Tudor Gardner, Sumner Sewell, and Owen Brewster would go on to become governors of Maine in the post-war years. 1918, many of the deaths among members of the service weren't from combat injuries, but from the effects of the epidemic of Spanish influenza, which killed an estimated 50 to 100 million people around the world. Among the first places the flu appeared in New England was Camp Devens in Massachusetts, where many of the soldiers from Maine were encamped. From September 1918 on, more than 20% of the 50,000 soldiers there came down with the flu, which often developed into a deadly form of pneumonia. At the peak of the epidemic, more than 100 deaths a day were reported in the camp. Maine residents coming to visit friends or relatives in the camp brought the flu back to Maine with them. By late September, the flu was appearing throughout southern and central Maine. Before it was over, nearly 1% of Maine's population had died, more than 5,000 people. Since there was no effective treatment for the virus, Maine communities struggled to cope with the epidemic, attempting to ban large public gatherings and taking measures such as Portland's plan to strictly enforce the law against spitting in public. Among the more controversial efforts were attempts to ban church services. In response, in some communities, Catholic masses were held outdoors. The state also increased the power of state and local health authorities to deal with epidemics. Maine was one of the first states in the country to require physicians to report influenza cases and to give local boards of health the power to enforce quarantines. One outcome of the epidemic was the founding of Mercy Hospital in Portland, a response in part by the Catholic Church to the effort by some boards of health, including the one in Portland, to forbid indoor masses during the epidemic. In 1920, the population had grown to 768,014. In 1922, Dora Pinkham, a Republican from Fort Kent, became the first woman to serve in the Maine legislature thanks to the amendment to the U.S. Constitution giving women the right to vote two years earlier. After serving in the Maine House, Pinkham went on to be elected to the Maine Senate in 1926. Also in 1922, the first Pulitzer Prize for poetry went to Edward Arlington Robinson of Gardner, Maine. And in 1923, keeping the prize in Maine hands, the Pulitzer Poetry Award went to Maine native Edna St. Vincent Millay. In 1925, the first commercial radio station in Maine, WCSH, began broadcasting in Portland. Other stations had gone on the air before that time, but they were mostly amateur operations. WCSH was the first one to sell advertising and to be a full-blown commercial operation. In 1928, Westbrook resident and musician Rudy Valley began his radio career in which his distinctive crooning style of singing made him the first of the modern teen idols. His first shows originated from the Hi-Ho Club in New York City, owned by another Mainer, Lovell resident Don Dickerman. In 1929, Augusta State Airport was established at Keys Field.
In 1930, the population of Maine had reached 797,423. In 1931, Governor Percival Baxter began donations of land around Mount Katahdin that would eventually become Baxter State Park. In 1933, the month of May saw catastrophic fires in two of the communities in Maine in less than 10 days. On May 7th, a fire swept through the center of the city of Ellsworth, leveling 130 homes and businesses. The town later was rebuilt in fire-resistant brick as a result. On May 16th, a similar catastrophe struck the city of Auburn with a fire that destroyed 248 buildings. In 1935, spurred on by President Franklin Roosevelt, the federal government launched a project in Eastport to harness the energy of the ocean tides flowing through Passamaquoddy Bay. Roosevelt, who had a summer home on nearby Campobello Island, had supported the project for years, even before becoming president. Called the Passamaquoddy Tidal Project, it drew hundreds of workers to the area and went through about $7 million in funds in its first several months. But opposition from parties that included the public utilities, as well as fishermen concerned about the impact of the project on sea life, led Congress to discontinue funding only six months after it had started. The following year, the project's failure was a major factor behind the town of Eastport having to declare bankruptcy. Also in 1935, the business of downhill skiing in Maine got its start as townspeople in Freiburg organized a commercial rope tow on the town's jockey cap ski run, not only setting up the ski run, but also organizing an excursion train from Portland. Glenn Parkinson of the Ski Museum of Maine tells the story. In the 1930s, the state of Maine and the rest of the country was starting to come out of the Great Depression. Uh, in the early 30s, there was no time or money for recreation. But by the time you got into the mid-30s, there started to be a little bit more time and interest in, in recreation. The town of Freiburg uh, started to see visitors in the summertime, and that was very helpful to the business community. So in the winter of 1935, uh, 34, 35, six businessmen got together and they each kicked in $250 and built a ski tow uh, on what's known as jockey cap. It was the first rope tow in the state. They charged 25 cents a day and they ran a snow train. And the first day, a Sunday, February 3rd, 1935, they ran a snow train from Portland that, that brought hundreds of people to the community. That day, there were 300 people skiing on Jockey Cap, and there were 3,000 people that had come from Portland and surrounding communities to watch the skiers. It was a, uh, it was a banner day for the town, and the town of Freiburg continued that tradition. They ran snow trains for the rest of the winter and the next couple years. In 1937, one of the largest labor conflicts in Maine's history took place in Lewiston and Auburn as employees of the shoe manufacturers in the two cities went on strike. Thousands of workers walked off the job at the 19 shoe companies in the two cities on March 25, 1937. Rachel DeGrosier, founding executive director of Museum LA in Lewiston, explains. Yes, um, the, uh, it was a huge industry because there were 14 big, big uh, shoe companies in Auburn and there were five in Lewiston. Uh, Auburn was called Shoe City because they pushed out so many. They had over 8,000, 10,000 workers at a time working in the shoe industry. And it was a bustling industry. And what happened was Massachusetts got involved in labor unions and so forth before. So their wages had gone up. And so the workers here were trying to, it was new to them. And so they were just trying to build a lab, labor unions. They started, um, they, were, they needed higher wages and um, uh, they wanted to have a say in what was being, uh, what was being done. And uh, that's why they decided to strike. There had been unsuccessful attempts at organizing the shoe workers previously, but when union organizers from Massachusetts arrived in 1937, the effort took hold. Powers Hapgood, the New England Secretary for the Committee for Industrial Organizations, the CIO, arrived in Lewiston on March 12th to coordinate the strike. Later, he was jailed for two months for contempt of court for his role in continuing the strike in the wake of an injunction by the Maine Supreme Judicial Court forbidding strike activity. The strike came to a dramatic climax on April 21st as workers tried to march across the South Bridge on the Androscoggin River. Governor Louis Barrows called in the National Guard. De Grosier describes the situation. The, the governor was for the manufacturers 
So when, uh, when the big strike, when they had a, a march that came across the bridge it, from Auburn to Lewiston, which is now the Bernard Lowne Peace Bridge, is um, they, uh, they brought in, the, na the governor sent in the National Guard. There's a famous picture in the, in the Lewiston Sun Journal that shows the, poli the National Guard actually beating down a woman on the, on the, in the middle of the bridge. And so that, that was the type of strife that there was there. Since the federal government had recently enacted laws guaranteeing the right of workers to vote for and have a union, an election supervised by the U.S. Department of Labor took place on May 15th, with the overwhelming majority of the workers voting to join the United Shoeworkers of America. However, with overwhelming opposition from the manufacturers, the city's political establishment, and most community leaders, the union was never able to gain a foothold, and the strike has been considered to be a loss for the union. De Grosier explains. Although they won, supposedly won their cause, whatever, it didn't follow through because the power of the manufacturers and the owners of the businesses was so strong that um, it, it just didn't follow through. Uh, Charles Scontris, who's a famous historian, um, labor historian, um, said that nobody actually won because at the time, they were really bustling, and then when the workers tried to go back to work, they weren't allowed in, or their jobs were taken. Also, the manufacturers didn't win because um, they, didn't, they ended up, after a while, not having enough people, and uh, the economy started going down. They had a the recession came in, and so... Uh, because of the strife for so then the strike was so long, it went from March to June, the end of June of 1937. And uh, so uh, a lot of the shoe manufacturers, especially the smaller ones, had to close. So they lost the shoe businesses there. And it, it's, it's said that that is when the decline of the shoe business started after that great shoe strike. In 1938, the first full-scale commercial ski area in Maine opened at Pleasant Mountain in Bridgeton and remains in operation today as Shawnee Peak. Glenn Parkinson of the Ski Museum of Maine explains. In the 1930s, as people started to have more leisure time, uh, they began to ski. And there was a group from the Portland area that used to travel to North Conway to ski at Cranmore. And as they were driving through Bridgeton, they kept looking up at this hillside and at Pleasant Mountain. And they stopped one time and asked the local farmer, the landowner, if he would mind if they skied there. And there was a fence in the middle of the field and the farmer said, well, you can take down my fence in the fall so long as it's back up in the spring. So for a couple years, they, they skied on the slopes there on uh, Pleasant Mountain. Then the CCC arrived in the mid thirties and the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps, was designed to uh, create jobs and to do land improvements, amongst other things. On Pleasant Mountain, they created the first ski trails from the top of the mountain. The, that winter of uh, February 3rd, 1938, was the first year that the, that the lift ran there at Pleasant Mountain. That was the first true commercial ski area in the state, uh, the opening of Pleasant Mountain with the infrastructure of the lifts and the base lodge. Uh, several years ago, it was purchased by a Pennsylvania company and took on the name of Shawnee Peak. So that original ski area of Pleasant Mountain on Pleasant Mountain is now Shawnee Peak Ski Area and it's been open since 1938. In 1940, the population of Maine had reached 847,226. In that year, Presque Isle incorporated as a city. Also in that year, Margaret Chase Smith was elected to Congress for the first time. A Skowhegan resident, she ran after her husband Clyde Smith, who was the congressman from the area, suffered a heart attack and died. After serving four terms, she ran for the Senate in 1949 and won, becoming the first woman to serve in both houses of Congress. 
she achieved national recognition when she defied the strong anti-communist opinion of the day by criticizing Senator Joseph McCarthy's anti-communist witch hunt in her 1950 speech, Declaration of Conscience. Events in Maine that year also led to an eventual Supreme Court decision. A mob estimated at 2,000 attacked the Jehovah's Witness Kingdom Hall building in Kennebunkport on June 9th and burned it down in reaction to the Jehovah's Witnesses' refusal to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. This was part of a wave of Pledge of Allegiance-related anti-Jehovah's Witness violence in the country that finally abated when the Supreme Court ruled that the First Amendment included the right not to be forced by the government to recite the pledge or any other oath. The case, West Virginia State Board of Education v. Barnett, was released on June 14, Flag Day, 1943. In 1941, the Maine Legislature authorized the creation of the Maine Maritime Academy at Castine for training merchant sea officers. The first class entered in October 1941 and graduated after a two-year program in 1943. And, of course, in December 1941, World War II was declared. Maine eventually sent about 80,000 of its residents to serve in the armed forces. 2,556 were killed. The war spurred the development of several military airfields throughout Maine, which in turn led to numerous airplane crashes as young, inexperienced pilots moved planes from airfield to airfield and practiced for combat. The first fatal crash of a military aircraft in Maine occurred on November 15, 1941, when a Douglas B-18 Bolo bomber heading to Bangor Army Airfield went down in Springfield, killing all four crew. In all, hundreds of military planes crashed in Maine during the Second World War, with 143 fatalities. The most costly were two that happened on July 11, 1944. Here's the story. There are two monuments in the state of Maine, about 125 miles apart from one another, that commemorate a day in July 1944 when the worst air disasters in the history of the state took place. One of these is on Deer Mountain near Rangeley. The other is in South Portland. The Deer Mountain Monument commemorates the crash of a B-17 bomber which went down killing all 10 of its crew members on the morning of July 11th. The bomber had taken off about 10 hours earlier from an airfield in Kearney, Nebraska. It was on the way to Europe, but the plan was for it to stop in Bangor to refuel. The plane hit bad weather in the middle of the country and several pieces of its equipment were knocked out. By the time it reached New England, it was flying in very heavy cloud cover and it's assumed that the crew at that point weren't sure exactly where they were. Apparently, as reconstructed after the accident, the uh, crew f flew beneath the clouds to try to get a visual take on, on exactly where they are, and it's assumed that they were able to figure out that they were near Rangeley, where there was a small airport at which they could make an emergency landing. So they were circling the Rangeley area when apparently the plane uh, got too low and its wings clipped the treetops and it cartwheeled and crashed on Deer Mountain. When the accident occurred on the morning of July 11th, it was the worst uh, aviation accident that had ever occurred in the state of Maine. That wasn't true for very long, however, because at the same time that the B-17 was making its way across the United States, a smaller bomber, an A-26, was taking off from Barksdale Airfield in Louisiana. At the controls was a young lieutenant by the name of Philip Russell. Russell was a native of South Portland. He'd graduated not long previously from South Portland High School, and he'd gotten permission from his superiors to take a long training flight in which he'd have the chance to fly back to Portland, land, and visit his family and friends. When the A-26, with Russell at the controls, reached Portland late in the afternoon of July 11th, the airport was so badly socked in with fog that it had to be closed. His family and his friends were waiting at the airport for him, and it is said that they caught a glimpse of his plane briefly, but tragically, shortly after seeing the plane, they saw an explosion take place in South Portland, only a short distance away. Tragically, the A-26 crashed into a government-run housing project in South Portland, and it killed not only Russell and his co-pilot, it also killed 17 residents of the housing project and wounded 20 others. It became the worst air accident that's ever happened in the state of Maine. Between the two accidents that day, 29 people died. Maine felt the effects of the war, too, by the establishment of several prisoner of war camps in Aroostook County. With the labor shortages growing out of the war, the military allowed some Aroostook County farmers to use German prisoners to work in their fields. 
In 1943, the last log drive took place on the Saco River. In 1947, widespread forest fires broke out in Maine. 1947 is now called the year that Maine burned. Forest fires consumed approximately 200,000 acres, with the worst damage in York County and Mount Desert Island. The fire destroyed numerous homes and buildings and killed a reported 16 people. By the second week of October 1947, forests and vegetation had become so dry that the state was declared to be in a Class 4 state of danger, meaning high state of inflammability. Fire watchtowers, normally closed at the end of September, were reopened by the State Forest Service. Reports of small fires in the woods began coming into the Forest Service on October 7th. By October 19th, hundreds of fires in disparate parts of Maine were blazing, and many communities in Maine breathed air filled with a smoky haze and the smell of burning wood. Hardest hit was northern York County, where a fire cut a charred swath 25 miles long from Shapley to Kennebunk. Also hard hit was Mount Desert Island, where more than 17,000 acres burned. Battled both by local firefighters and servicemen sent in by the U.S. Army and Navy, the fires finally burned themselves out in early November. In December 1947, the first section of the main turnpike opened, running from Kittery to Portland. When the authority cut the ribbon on the new road, the main turnpike was the first superhighway built in the post-war era and one of only two modern toll roads in existence in the United States at that time. The Pennsylvania Turnpike was the other one. The main turnpike was the first superhighway in the world to be paved entirely with asphalt, not concrete. In 1948, Andrew Wyeth painted the iconic Christina's World, a portrait of Christina Olson of Cushing, Maine. Part 4, Maine to the 21st Century In 1950, the population of Maine had reached 913,774. The Korean War started in June of 1950. Nearly 30,000 Mainers served in the conflict and there were 242 fatalities. In 1953, the first commercial television station in Maine, WABI in Bangor, went on the air January 25th. In 1954, Edmund Muskie was elected governor, the first Democrat to be elected in 20 years. Author Jim Witherall, whose work includes the book Ed Muskie, Made in Maine, tells the story. Ed Muskie's election to governor in 1954 is significant because he, he was only the uh, fifth Democratic governor elected since the Civil War. Uh, the second in 20 years, and the third Democratic governor in 40 years. Uh, at the time, the Democratic Party was in such disarray that there was a joke around the State House that the Democrats could caucus in a phone booth, and that was really almost the case. By the time that the Democrats held their convention in Lewiston, they still didn't have a candidate for governor and uh, Ed was more interested in running for Congress in the 2nd District because he wouldn't have to travel the whole state campaigning. And most of the stories go that they asked everybody who was even remotely qualified if they wanted to run for governor, and it ended up being Ed saying, oh, what the hell, I'll run. So he had worked for 18 months previously traveling across the state for the Office of Price Stabilization during the Korean War and was well known and liked in almost uh, every community that he had visited and he visited almost all of them from uh, Kittery to Madawaska. Muskie was helped uh, by a couple of things in his campaign. One was the the advent of uh, local television stations. Ed Muskie got elected by about 20,000 votes, I believe, which is the amount he was supposed to lose by, according to Governor Cross. The uh, Republicans were so sure of themselves that they, they really didn't take Muskie seriously. But it turned out that Governor Cross was kind of like the best ad that Muskie could have had because he, uh, one person said he seemed to go out of his way to irritate people, whereas Muskie was calm and rational and and had, had the facts, all the facts at hand, to the point where he became uh, almost an expert on whatever subject he was talking about. 
Another result of the November 1954 elections was that Native Americans in Maine finally got full voting rights when a statewide referendum was approved by a three-to-one margin. The referendum amended a section of the state constitution which had denied voting rights to those Native Americans who lived on tribal lands and were not subject to state taxes as a result. After the vote, all Native Americans could vote. People living in tribal reservations were still free from state taxes, but tribal representatives in the state legislature remained observers only. Also in 1954, Burlington Mills, then the nation's largest textile firm, bought the former Goodall Mill in Sanford. But Burlington just disassembled the Sanford factory and moved the looms there to factories in the south. Burlington closed the Sanford Mill, leaving 3,600 unemployed and 2 million square feet of empty mill space. Local business owners began traveling the Northeast to entice employers to move to the area. In November 1955, a television show on NBC TV, the Armstrong Circle Theater, dramatized Sanford's situation in a broadcast called The Town That Refused to Die, starring Darren McGavin and Jason Robarts. In June 1956, the first B-52 arrived for basing at Loring Air Force Base in Limestone, making that base a critical link in the country's strategic air command defense system. On September 25th, the first direct cable phone call from the United States to Europe was made. All such calls at that time were routed through Portland's Forest Avenue Telephone Exchange Building. In 1960, the population of Maine was 969,000. In 1961, a futuristic-looking dome suddenly appeared in the woods in Andover, Maine. It was the Andover Earth Station, and it was built to send and receive signals from the first American telecommunications satellite, Telstar. It provided the first experimental satellite telephone and television service between North America and Europe. The local school district wound up choosing the name Telstar for its new high school being built in Bethel. In 1963, the Thresher catastrophe occurred. On April 9, 1963, the Thresher submarine, commanded by Lieutenant Commander John Wesley Harvey, got underway from Kittery. Eventually, it sank with 129 aboard in an area some 190 miles east of Cape Cod, Massachusetts. At that time, it was the greatest loss of life in a submarine accident in peacetime. In 1964, the escalation of the Vietnam War began. Nearly 50,000 Mainers were in some branch of the service during the Vietnam era, not all sent to Vietnam, but among Mainers serving in Vietnam there were 341 recorded fatalities. In 1965, Maine country singer Dick Curlis recorded the hit Tombstone Every Mile, written by Dan Fulkerson. The song refers to the Haynesville Woods, an area around the small town of Haynesville in Arusta County in northern Maine. In 1967, Caribou was incorporated as a city. Also in 1967, the state of Maine participated in a year-long effort to try to become the host site of the 1976 Winter Olympics. Encouraged by private investors who planned to develop a ski resort on Bigelow Mountain near Stratton and Rangeley, the state went so far as to win the endorsement of the New England Governor's Conference for their bid. Consultants were hired to study various sites as Olympic venues, and they reported back that Maine had the mountains and the ski trails necessary for the Olympics. Augusta would be used as the headquarters for events throughout western Maine, but the state was counting on private investors to make the improvements that would be needed for the Olympic sites, and the investment never materialized. In November 1967, Governor Kenneth Curtis officially ended Maine's Olympic bid. The 1976 Winter Olympics were held finally in Innsbruck, Austria. In 1968, the Air Force Base in Bangor was closed and turned over to the city to become Bangor International Airport. A section of the Air Force Base remains in use by the Maine Air National Guard. In 1970, the population of Maine was 994,000. In 1971, the Maine Mall in South Portland opened. A former pig farm was chosen as a site for the project because it was close to I-95 and convenient from Portland. The construction of the Maine Mall marked a major transition in the western part of South Portland. It had been mostly farmland. Now it's the area's largest retail center. In 1972, Congress passed the Clean Water Act, sponsored by Maine Senator Edmund Muskie. James Witherall, whose work includes the book Ed Muskie, Made in Maine, explains. Ed Muskie became known as Mr. Clean for his support of the environment through the 
Clean uh, Air and Clean Water Acts of the early 70s. He tried to do something about it as governor, but um, money and resources were limited at the time. But when he got to Washington as a senator in 1959, it didn't take him long to figure out he could f form the, uh, the subcommittee on uh, air and water pollution and was the driving force behind the uh, Clean Air Act of 1970, which led directly to the Clean Water Act of 1972 as Muskie ran for higher and higher office and gained prestige in the Senate. The passage of the Clean Water Act marked a successful end to 1972 for Edmund Muskie, but it hadn't started out so successfully. 1972 was the year when he tried and failed to win the Democratic nomination for president. Uh, Ed Muskie's 1972 uh, presidential bid probably had its origins back in 1968 when he uh, was Hubert Humphrey's uh, vice presidential uh, running mate. And uh, there was even a political cartoon saying that the ticket probably should have been the other way around with the cartoon showing uh, Muskie literally carrying Humphrey on his back. Nixon considered him to be probably uh, the, his biggest worry in, in his re-election campaign, so he focused on Muskie with dirty tricks, including a letter saying that he'd insulted Canadians, calling them Canucks. The ultimate downfall of the uh, Muskie's uh, 72 presidential bid happened on a flatbed trailer on a snowy day out front of the Manchester Union leader when uh, he was talking about um, his wife, defending his wife from the rumors and stories and insults that were circulating. Um, a lot of people say he cried that day. Other people said it was just snow melting on his face. Whether or not he actually cried, uh, Muskie went to Florida, didn't do as well as expected. And I think by May, his uh, presidential run in 1972 was over. In 1975, James Bernard Longley Sr. was elected governor as an independent, the first independent in the state's history. The owner of a successful insurance agency in Lewiston, Longley had been appointed by the prior governor, Democratic Governor Kenneth Curtis, to a state commission intended to make government more efficient. Longley made several recommendations that saved the state millions of dollars, and he became well enough known as a result that he decided to run for governor when Curtis retired in 1974. Longley had been a lifelong Democrat, but due to his reputation as a cost cutter and because he inadvertently missed the filing deadline for party candidates in the gubernatorial election, he ran as an independent. Longley became known for his abrasive comments and confrontational style toward legislators in the media and issued a record number of vetoes. Having promised to serve only one term, he retired in 1979. In 1977, the historic redevelopment of the Old Port in Portland was spurred when, responding to a real estate investment consortium called the Old Port Association, the city of Portland issued bonds to build the Cumberland County Civic Center on the edge of the district. With tax incentives and federal grants, developers took the old buildings, apartments, and warehouses and turned them into a revitalized, historic-looking commercial and tourist area, which has become one of Portland's foremost attractions. In 1980, the population of Maine was 1,124,660. In 1980, the Old Orchard Beach Pier was rebuilt after being destroyed by the blizzard of 1978. The current structure stretches 500 feet out into the Atlantic Ocean. Also in 1980, the U.S. Congress settled the claims that Native American tribes in Maine had placed on millions of acres of property by paying a settlement of $81.5 million to the Penobscot, Passamaquoddy, and Maliseet tribes. An additional million was paid out to Maine tribes over the next two decades in supplemental settlements. The tribes had originally sought $25 billion in compensation for claims on 12.5 million acres, claiming that all treaties giving tribal lands to settlers were void since they were never approved by Congress. The claim, covering nearly two-thirds of the land in Maine, threatened the titles of thousands of property owners. In exchange for the settlement, the Penobscot, Passamaquoddy, and Maliseet tribes relinquished all further claims to land in Maine other than their existing tribal lands. 
In 1983, the last crank telephone system in the United States ended when the Bryan Pond Phone Company in Bryan Pond closed. Its system had preserved the original telephone technology in which customers had to turn a crank on their phones to get a connection, and operators had to connect all the calls by hand. The Bryan Pond Phone Company still had over 400 customers with crank phones when the system was finally converted over to a standard landline system. A statue of a giant phone was erected in Bryant Pond in commemoration. In 1985, Dr. Bernard Lown, who spent his teenage years in Auburn after immigrating from Lithuania with his parents, shared the Nobel Peace Prize with Russian Dr. Evgeny Shazov of the Soviet Union for their work in having formed the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War. Lown is also known as the developer of the cardiac defibrillator and for several other advances in the treatment of heart disease. A bridge connecting Lewiston and Auburn over the Androscoggin River has been dedicated to him as the Bernard Lown Peace Bridge. In 1986, the USS Samuel B. Roberts, a guided missile frigate, was commissioned at Bath Iron Works. The ship was damaged two years later by an Iranian mine, leading to a several-day battle in 1988 between U.S. and Iranian naval forces in the Persian Gulf. The Roberts was returned to Bath, repaired, and was back in service within a year. Also in 1986, a bitter 76-day strike at the paper mill in Rumford followed the next year by an 18-month strike at the paper mill in Jay, precipitated the decline of organized labor in the paper industry. After hundreds of their members had lost their jobs to non-union replacements, the Rumford strikers had to settle without winning their demands, and in Jay the following year, the strike crippled the union so badly that, three years later, it was voted out of the plant by the remaining workers. The loss of the strike not only weakened unions, it also signaled the end of an era in many main communities where being able to get a well-paid job at the local mill was almost guaranteed. In 1987, a sudden thaw of a deep snowpack in the spring caused catastrophic flooding among many of Maine's rivers, including the Kennebec and the Androscoggin. Former Androscoggin County Emergency Management Agency Director Joanne Potvin describes how it was in Lewiston and Auburn. In the flood of 87, at the height of the water, we were at 23.65 feet. Water was just above the first floor window uh, behind Roke Block Building. So anybody who left their vehicles there, the vehicles would have been flooded. Uh, anything in the basements of those buildings was d d definitely uh, submerged in water. Um, if we're looking just in the city of Lewiston, crossing from Lewiston into Auburn at the Longley Bridge, uh, the clearance under the bridge was less than one foot at the height of the flood. Um, the railroad trestle that you can see from the Longley Bridge as you look up uh, over the Great Falls Rocks, uh, the water was just inches uh, under the, the, the trestle. Um, if you were going into New Auburn, uh, Laurel Avenue, Newberry Street, that whole area, we had water uh, just to about halfway up the first floor windows. It caused extensive damage, uh, nearly a million dollars in Androscoggin County alone. Um, you can't stop the mighty Androscoggin River, so it does what it wants to do. And uh, uh, what we can do is, you know, help prepare the, the, the municipalities that are going to be affected by the river, uh, hoping that people heed our advice when we give them the, the advice that they have to relocate or evacuate, uh, move to higher ground. Um, so the river, the river has a mind of its own, and it, it's going to do what it wants to do. In 1990, the population of Maine was 1,227,928. In 1993, voters approved term limits for legislators and some state officers by a two-to-one margin. The question had been placed before the voters by a citizen's referendum. The following year, the voters tried to extend term limits to members of Congress from Maine, but the federal courts overturned it. 1998 was marked by the ice storm, which began on January 4th. The massive regional ice storm hit parts of the Northeast and Canada. Central Maine was particularly hard hit. The storm resulted in millions of dollars worth of damage. By daybreak on January 9th, Central Maine Power reported that 275,000 customers, representing about 600,000 people, had lost electricity. It was the costliest storm in Central Maine Power's history. 
The cracking and falling of ice-laden branches in many places sounded like gunfire. The Augusta Civic Center, Colby College's Fieldhouse in Waterville, and many other public buildings were opened as emergency shelters. Most city dwellers got their power back within a few days, but residents of some rural areas waited for weeks. In 1999, Bethel, Maine was the home of the world's tallest snowman. Called Angus in honor of the incumbent governor, it was 10 stories tall. The mouth was made out of car tires, the buttons were skitter tires, the arms were 25-foot spruce trees, and the hat was a 16-foot fabric construction made by middle school students. Newry resident and civil engineer Jim Sisko was in charge of the project, which he described in a 2013 interview. Uh, back in 1999, uh, the town of Bethel was looking for something to stimulate uh, business here, and uh, the Chamber of Commerce came up with an idea to build the world's tallest snowman. And uh, they went to the planning board, and the planning board asked them, well, who's going to be in charge? And they gave my name to the planning board, and I didn't know it until two weeks later when I was told I was going to supervise building world's tallest snowman. Um, and that was a pretty successful operation. We did set a Guinness Book of World Records on that. What are the uh, uh, engineering considerations for the uh, huge snowman? Could, could just anybody do it, or did you need to uh, uh, do uh, mathematical calculations? And uh... Well, the first consideration is how much snow do you need, and uh, how are you going to get that snow? Um, so I figured out a rough idea of how much snow we needed, and then Sunday River, uh, of course, was very interested in what we were doing, and. Uh, they volunteered the use of their snow guns. So uh, we made snow that uh, winter, I remember, in, uh, in December and in January. And we had enough probably by the end of uh, January to go ahead and build that, snow, that uh, snowman. The town of Bethel topped Angus in 2008 by building a bigger snow sculpture yet, a snow woman named Olympia in honor of the incumbent senator, which reached 11 stories tall. Also in 1999, the possession and use of small amounts of marijuana by people certified to have a medical need for it was legalized when voters approved a citizen-initiated referendum on the November ballot. In 2000, the population of Maine was 1,274,923. In 2001, after a century and a half in business, the Bates Mill in Lewiston closed, symptomatic of the flight of textile manufacturing to areas with lower labor and other costs. In 2001, Maine played a tragic role in the September 11th attacks as two of the terrorists stayed in South Portland the night before their attack on the World Trade Center and flew to Boston from Portland Airport. In the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, which followed September 11th, over a thousand Mainers served in the armed forces and over 40 died. In December 2001, passenger railroad service returned to Maine for the first time since the 1960s when the Downeaster Amtrak train began operations between Portland and Boston on December 15th. Service on the Downeaster was later expanded to Brunswick, and potential expansions to Lewiston and Rockland have been proposed. In 2002, Richard Russo, a resident of Camden, won the Pulitzer Prize for Distinguished Fiction by an American author for Empire Falls, a book about a declining mill town in Maine. In 2003, the last wooden clothespin and toothpick factory in the United States closed down as Foster's in Strong shut its doors. Also that year, the road to casino gambling in Maine was opened as voters narrowly approved an initiated question on the November ballot supposedly to allow slot machines at racetracks or within a five-mile radius of racetracks. Hollywood Slots in Bangor took advantage of the five-mile rule, opening a casino in Bangor in 2005. Bangor officials credit the operation of the casino with giving them the funds they needed to build a civic center and revitalize parts of the city. In the same election, however, voters refused to allow the development of a casino on the Passamaquoddy or Penobscot tribal lands. In 2009, the last remaining large-scale textile company in Maine, West Point Home, closed in Biddeford. In 
2010, the population of Maine was 1,328,361. In that year, the last sardine cannery in the United States, in Prospect Harbor, closed its doors. In 2012, in November, the first independent to win a Senate seat in Maine was elected as Angus King won the seat with slightly more than 51% of the vote. Also in 2012, voters approved a referendum question that had been put on the ballot by citizens' petition allowing same-sex marriage. In 2015, on October 1st, the merchant ship El Faro was caught in a hurricane near the Bahamas. The ship sank, taking the lives of five graduates of the Maine Maritime Academy, including four who still lived in Maine. In 2016, marijuana use became legal, even for recreational purposes, when voters approved a referendum question put on the ballot by citizens' petition legalizing personal possession and use of the weed. Also in that election, Maine voters approved ranked choice voting for statewide elections for governor, state legislature, and Congress. In 2017, on June 23rd, a massive fire in a century-old abandoned mill building in Sanford brought more than 100 firefighters from 20 communities to fight the blaze. The nearly 300,000-foot complex was destroyed. Two days later, three boys from Sanford, two 13-year-olds and a 12-year-old, were charged with felony arson. They pleaded guilty and were placed on probation. Also in 2017, voters approved a referendum question requiring the state to expand its Medicaid program to give most low-income people health insurance. Then-Governor Paul LePage disagreed with expanding Medicaid and declined to carry out the results of the referendum despite lawsuits by supporters. In January 2019, newly elected Governor Janet Mills signed an order and Medicaid was finally expanded in accordance with the referendum vote. In 2018, Janet Mills became the first woman to be elected to the governorship in the state of Maine. Mills had previously been Attorney General, where she had also been the first woman to hold the position. I'm Governor Janet Mills. On Wednesday night, standing with my grandchildren and my niece, with my hand raised above my heart, I swore to support the Constitution of the United States and of our great state, and to faithfully discharge my duties as Governor of the state of Maine. It was the highest honor of my life to take the oath of office to become Maine's 75th governor.